Hello, everybody. I am so happy that once again you chose to join us for our Bible study. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, once again we come asking that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive your fresh. Father, we thank you and we love you in advance and always. Amen. So we are continuing with article number 12, the harmony of the law and the gospel. And our author writes, he says, we believe that the law of God is the eternal and unchangeable rule of his moral government, that it is holy, just, and good, and that the inability which the scripture ascribes to fallen men to fulfill its precepts arises entirely from their love of sin to deliver them from which and to restore them through a mediator to unfeigned obedience to the holy law is one great end of the gospel and of the means of grace connected with the establishment of the visible church. <clears throat> and so we are continuing uh, with Galatians, the third chapter, verses 19 through 25, and this is the NIV version. It says, what then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. A mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin, so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put into charge, put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. So because our main scripture uh, is concerning the promise given to Abraham, we, a uh, couple, uh, couple lessons ago, decided to first look at the promise. And so we've been looking at the promise to Abraham and how it unfolds throughout the book of Genesis. The promise began in chapter 12 of Genesis where God called Abram to leave his family and his kinfolk. God promised to bless him and he said, I'll bless you and I'll bless all the families on the earth through you. And then in chapter 13, uh, we see the hand of God separating Lot from Abram. One of the things that stand out to me is that you can't box God in on what he can do and how he ought to do it and, and how he can only do it this way. God uses blessings to separate Abraham and Lot. God blessed them so much that they couldn't remain together. Genesis 13 verses 5 through 7, the NIV says, Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot. The Canaanites and Parasites uh, were also living in the land at that time. And so I think that there are probably two times, at least two times, that a person's heart really speaks volumes as to who they are. It's when there is an abundance and when there is a lack and translation when you got a lot of money and stuff or when you are broke and i say when people show you who they are you should believe them abram uh may have failed the first two tests from god but he he's on point with this test remember god told him to leave his country and his kinfolk and 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 he left his country 
but his kin folk came along with it. So that was test number one that he didn't quite do all that he should have done. Then there was a famine that came in the land, in the land of promise. And instead of Abram trusting God who got him there, he left his altar and went to Egypt and trusted lying and scheming to survive. But in this test with his nephew Lot, he trusted God enough to separate from Lot. He, he, he uh, pursued peace in the separation by giving Lot first choice of the land. Now, he, he wasn't afraid of missing out on the best. You know how we do. We like to be, you know, give me a first choice so I can get the best. But in this, Lot showed his heart. And he showed that his heart was really all about the wealth and the achievement. And Abraham's heart was bent toward pleasing God. So when Lot showed the bent of his heart, Abraham just let him go in that direction. He didn't try to talk him out of it. He just let him go. The lesson there is is, is to quit trying to hold on to folk they're not going in the same direction that you are. They're only going to cause more trouble. Let them go. Lot chose what looked good. And I think Abraham knew in his heart of hearts that they would have to separate eventually, either now or later. That They were on two different paths. Lot was of the world and Abraham was of God. Lot chose what looked like green pastures. He packed up his stuff and his people and he left. He moved completely out of Canaan, even though he knew God had led them there. I guess Lot figured, you know, kind of like we do, once we're blessed, then we're like, Lord, I can take it from here. One thing that kind of uh, caused tension for me uh, every time I read every time I read that verse it is the statement at the end of verse seven. Uh, verse seven starts by saying, "And quarreling arose between Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot." Then, as though it was an afterthought or just an insert, the end of that verse says. The Canaanites and the Parasites were also living in the land at that time. And so that tells me that the enemy was watching. They were watching the fighting that was going on. And, 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 and that also tells me that we should be careful, especially as Christians, who sees us when we're acting like the world. Anyway, after Lot left, God once again came to visit Abraham and unfolded more of the promise. Genesis, the 13th chapter, verses 14 through 18, and this is the King James Version. It says, And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. Look all around. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the land of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. So we see in this Abram's walk of faith. He, 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 he's a pilgrim in, in the land. He, he's living in a tent, which means that he can pack up his tent and, and go whenever, whenever he's called to go. Whereas Lot found a spot and settled down with permanent housing in the land of the heathens, 
when, when God told Abram to, Abram to get up, Abram packed up his tent and wherever he went, he built an altar unto the Lord. Don't, and, and here again, don't forget, the Canaanites and the parasites were also living in the land at that time. So they also saw this man, Abram, worshiping the true and living God wherever he went. Wherever he went, he packed up his tent. When he got there, he built an altar to God. Then in chapter 15, God once again comes to Abram to confirm and unfold the promise. And in, in, in chapter 14, God put emphasis on the land that Abram and his seed would inherit. But in this chapter, in chapter 15, the emphasis is on his descendants that will come from his own body. In verse 6, it says, Abraham Abram believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. And in verse seven, God reminded Abram of his faithfulness. He, he says, in essence, I was the one that brought you up out of Ur of the Chaldeans with a purpose and a plan. And God reminded him, I'm the one that brought you up. I'm the one that brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans. And I brought you with a purpose and a plan. That's a reminder to me also and to us. The story of Abraham or Abram is written in the Bible as an encouragement for us. When, when I'm waiting on God to do something about my current situation, and, and it seems like, you know, he's taking too much time. It's always good to remind myself of what he has already done, what, what he has already brought me from, and where he has brought me from. It, it, it's so easy uh, to focus on what we don't yet have and forget all that we do have. You know, we are guilty of we want it right now. It, well, in essence, we want it yesterday. And so often we, we're so focused on that that we forget what God has already done. Abraham or Abram, like us, was focused on what he didn't have, namely an heir. But God let him know that all that he was assuming was not how it would be because God had a plan and God's plan would come to pass. You ever looked at your circumstances, your current situation, and in your mind, you know, you like me, you come up with all the options or the only options that God has, which God has so many ways to work things out. Looking at Abram's story shows us how foolish that is, but I get it. Abram is looking at the obvious. Right now, he has no children. And as the years come and go, he, and he sees it as his, it's like as the years come and go, so does the possibility of it happening. You know, because he was 75 when God called him. And Abram is seeing year after year after year after year go by and no children. And so he's looking at the physical and thinking, this is getting to be a problem. But God's promise does not change. And God's promise does not depend on us. He does not, God's promise does not depend on the physical. Abraham put his assumptions aside. He, he, he put aside what seemed like the thing that would happen, and he believed God instead. He, he, he got rid of the, the, the thought process that, you know, my, my servant is going to be my heir, and I don't have any kids, and I'm getting older, and all this kind of stuff. He put it aside which is telling me that, that that's what faith is. It's believing God, not just in spite of, but also in the midst of what 
not only seems to be impossible, but is impossible. But God is in that thing. He is controlling every aspect of it. And time belongs to God. And so God's promise to Abram was upgraded to a covenant and ratified by his divine appearance. God put Abram to sleep and gave him the short version of the history of him and his descendants. The amazing thing to me is that God let Abram know that the promise was more about his seed. He, Abram, was just a part of the picture, not the whole picture. God let him know that he, Abram, would not live to see any of this come to pass. He, he, could, he, he said, but he could be sure of it. In, in other words, God says, know of a surety. In other words, you can know for sure. And the evidence that Abraham, Abram, believed God and passed the promise on to his descendants it is that hundreds of years later, when his descendants were in Egypt, just like God said, and, and when Joseph, uh, Abram's great grandson, was dying, he told the folk around him, he says, when God delivers us, when he brings us out of Egypt, he says, carry my bones with you. So and, and, and Joshua, the 24th chapter, verse 32 says, And Joseph's bones, which the Israelites had brought up from Egypt, were, were buried at Shechem. Remember Shechem was the first place Abram landed in Canaan. Can you imagine how much better my life would be? How much better your life would be? If we truly believed God, no matter how long it took, even if Abram is believing God, even though he won't even see the promise, he won't see what God has promised. It, 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 our life would be so much better if we believed his word that even if I don't see it in my lifetime, I believe my faith is so strong that I know with a surety and, 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 and then I pass that faith on to my children to give them the faith, to, to trust God, whether you see it in your lifetime or not, to trust him. And, and, and then to pass that trust, pass that faith along in such a way that they would pass it on to their children. These folk believed a promise that was over 400 years old, so much so that they brought the bones of a dead man with them and kept them until most of the fighting was done and the division of the land had happened. Then Joseph was buried in the land allotted to his descendants. Y'all, that's faith and faith in action, not just Say, yeah, yeah, God I believe, and then leave the bones and like, oh, what happened to the bones? We didn't bring the bones. No, they believed and they brought them and, and they kept them. And when the fighting had settled down, they buried him in the land allotted to his descendants, buried him in the land that God promised them. Then in Genesis, the 17th chapter, God appeared to Abram again to unfold more of the promise that is now a covenant. He he, taught, he changed his name to Abraham, which is father of many nations. And then he changed Sarah's name to Sarah, mother of many nations. And God confirmed that the land would be an everlasting possession for, for him and his descendants. One of the things that amazed me is how God is speaking to Abraham in the past, the present, and the future tense. In, in Genesis, the 17th chapter, verses 3 through 8, and this is the NIV, it says, Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. That's future tense. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. That's present tense. 
for I have made you a father of many nations. That is past tense. He's sounding like it's already done. He says, for I have made you a father of many nations. And verse six, I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the, for gener, for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and to your descendants after you, and I will be their God. All that is future and it's forever. It's not just next month or next year, it's forever. But our time is present and it's screaming in this lesson. So until next time, be blessed and stay safe and see you next time. Bye-bye. God bless.